This episode of Seminary Dropout is sponsored by the new book, Fish Sandwiches, The Delight of Receiving God's Promises by Troy Schmidt. Promises. We give them, we depend on them, and sometimes we break them. We might even wonder if God remembers his promises to us. Fish Sandwiches offers winsome and wise counsel through the story of feeding the 5,000. So check out the book Max Lucado says was a joy to the heart and strength for the soul. Find Fish Sandwiches wherever books are sold. You can find a link to it on the show notes for this show. You're listening to Seminary Dropout, and I'm your host, Shane Blackshear. In cooperation with MissioAlliance.org, straight from my house in Austin, Texas to yours, interviews with leading Christian authors, leaders, and thinkers, because good theology should be for everyone. This is Seminary Dropout. Let's go. My guest, Austin Fisher, is a lead pastor at Vista Community Church in Temple, Texas, and the author of Young, Restless, No Longer Reformed. His new book is called Faith in the Shadows, Finding Christ in the Midst of Doubt. Austin, welcome back to Seminary Dropout. Thanks so much for having me, man. It's been far, far, far too long, and I'm glad to be back on. I totally agree, man. I mentioned your first book, Young, Restless, No Longer Reformed. And, and that book uh, meant a lot to me, and I shared it with some friends who was really a game changer for them. Uh, so that was a big deal, and I suspect, after having read the new book, um, that, that the same thing is going to be the case. So I mentioned the title, Faith in the Shadows, Finding Christ in the Midst of Doubt. I get this sense that this wasn't like a book written after you kind of looked out the window and surveyed the needs of people around you, people in your church, but rather was a real kind of intimate journey that you really went on for yourself. Absolutely. Similar to um, the first book, I, I really don't know how to do theology that's not also kind of biographical. Um, That idea comes from, I think the guy's name was Scott McClendon, but he wrote a book called theology as biography. And I actually never read the book, but the idea stuck with me. And I think it's so true that we we work out our theology and we try to make sense of God as we try to make sense of our own lives and what God is doing in our lives and in the lives of people around us. And so I, um, I think there's a place for the more systematic uh, approaches and, and some sort of systematic theology is inevitable. But for me, um, theology has to be personal um, because it's it's a human being trying to make sense of God in the context of their own life and I don't really know or I have no interest really in producing something um, that isn't personal and so the book is a very personal book and it's written out of a very real crisis of faith that I went through um, you know it was a big crisis filled with a lot of many crises over a period of yeah three or four years I've spent a lot of time in the last several years thinking about doubt and the role of doubt. And I have a story similar to a lot of people who grew up in evangelicalism where um, doubt was kind of this scary monster in the closet that we tried to not acknowledge and pretend wasn't there. Um, But in the last several years after um, just growing and, and reading and I've really come to put doubt in a different place and, and, for one, be very open about it and acknowledge it, and also not see it as the enemy, but see it as is kind of a, a partner with along with faith. Um, it seems like you have somewhat of a similar journey as well. Yeah, I think, and I've got this question a lot, um, kind of in the last you know couple of months since the book has been out, just about is, is doubt, you know, is it sinful? Is it sinful for me to doubt and so on and so forth? And, and I have found it helpful to put doubt in the same category as something like sadness or sickness. And so obviously sadness and sickness are not things that God wants for us. Um, however, they're just an inevitable part of human experience in a fallen world. And so the question of whether or not our doubts are good is really irrelevant because we can't really decide whether or not we will doubt any more than we can decide whether or not we'll be sad or sick. They're just an inevitable part of human experience in a fallen world. And so I, I think it's helpful to just really move past the question of is doubt a good thing or a bad thing? Um, it's just a thing. It's just a part of being human. And while some of our doubts 
could probably qualify as, as sinful in a certain sense. Um, I think a lot of our doubts are just human. <laughs> There's nothing sinful about being human. We're impossibly small creatures living in an impossibly enormous universe, forced to live with these massive mysteries that are not of our choosing. And so doubt is just as, as natural as sadness and sickness in a fallen world. And so the question is not whether or not we'll doubt. It's will we learn how to doubt faithfully? And that's what the book is really meant to be an exercise in, in doing. It's one person's story of what it looked like to try to learn how to doubt faithfully. Recently, you probably heard about this. There is, I think it was on the Gospel Coalition, somebody wrote a, a post about how, um, essentially how being progressive or a progressive Christian can lead to atheism. Yeah. Um, and I just can't believe they did a post about that. It's shocking. <laughs> The the Gospel Coalition of all places. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't uh, help myself. No, no. Um, I I think there there may be a hint of truth in that, but I also think that from what I've seen, it's more rigid fundamentalism that's produced more atheists. Um, yeah. Than yeah. any other structure within Christianity, um, it just there comes a time where people cannot suspend disbelief long enough. And because they've been told that that version of Christianity is the only true version, um, instead of looking other places within Christianity, they just, they throw the whole baby out. I think that's well, very well said. Um, You know, that piece was interesting um, in a number of ways. I mean, a couple of the people they mentioned, like Derek Webb, I mean, Hell, Derek Webb was a Calvinist, you know, yeah. early on. So I don't know that it was progressive. I and mean, Rachel Held Evans, I mean, Rachel grew up very conservative evangelical. So it's kind of, I don't know. It, it's funny, and I think your point's well taken in the sense that it is absolutely true that um, there are certain reflexes within progressivism that could certainly lead one towards unbelief. I, I completely grant that. Um, however, there are at least as many r- reflexes and problems within conservative fundamentalism that also lead people to a broken faith. And in my experience as a pastor, and again, I, we were talking before we started recording, you know, my church is filled with progressives and conservatives and, and a lot of people in between. And in my experience, the people who I see walk away from their faith were not people who, you know, had questions and went searching for the truth and asking the question that everyone else was afraid to ask. The people I see walk away from faith were usually the people who had questions, but they were afraid to be honest about them until it was already too late. And so my experience very much was, and I think what you're describing is um, thinking of faith basically as this binary choice between certainty and unbelief, right? So uh, in order to have faith, it means I must be absolutely 100% bulletproof certain about every single article of Christian faith. I got to be certain about all of it or I don't believe any of it. Those are my only two options. Well, uh, when the doubts start to set in for you and and you realize how much you could never know, I mean, who of us really has the time or the intellectual capacity to fully understand every world religion? None of us have that. And so certainty just isn't in the cards for us. But if you've been taught that it has to be in the cards for you, then you've got a really tough decision to make because you think, well, if I can't be certain, then I can't have faith, then it looks like I have to walk away from my faith. And so people get forced into this unbiblical choice um, between certainty and unbelief that is not a biblical choice. Yeah, and I think that when I first heard or was aware of people acknowledging that, of, of Christians acknowledging that we, in the empirical sense, the, the 100% certainty sense, um, that we can't know that, it was such a relief because— It was something that I had intuitively felt for a very long time, but then felt like uh, that that was a immature thought to have for a Christian, Um, that I just hadn't reached some plane of spirituality to reach the certainty that these other people had. And and so it was so freeing when I had, when I just heard people be honest about it for the first time. I I completely agree. I mean, there's this sense that you have, um, well, I can always, I always tell people I have no desire to be conservative or progressive. You know, I think there are ways that we should be conservative and ways that we should be progressive. And so I think the real journey that we should all be on is not a journey from the right to the left or the left to the right, but a journey from being closed to being open yeah. and honest. Um, and, and I think 
if we're being honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that if God had wanted us to be certain, then God certainly has it within God's you know ability to do so. Um, but God clearly has not chosen um, to give us certainty, uh, not in the scriptures that he gave us or our religious experience or you name it. Um, certainty is just not in the cards for being a human. And again, that's not necessarily sinful. It's just human, not sinful. Let's talk about the Bible for a little bit, because you spend some time talking about that in the book. I've been rereading Scott McKnight's Blue Parakeet. Um, yeah. Have you read that book. one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just think that, that book is just such a gift to the church. Um, part of what I kept thinking when I was rereading that was, I, I'm really surprised that that the church doesn't have this down yet. I mean... <laughs> Like it should, it seems like it should be like how to read the Bible. Our hermeneutic for reading the Bible should be like one of the first things that we teach people when we're discipling yeah. them. Um, and or and I could even understand if there were there were differing hermeneutics. There are definitely differing hermene- hermeneutics, but that it feels like it's something that churches kind of are never really articulate to people. Like we kind of understand that we do follow some certain things Mm -hmm. and we don't follow some certain things. (laughs) And then maybe there's a, a subtle logic behind it. And, you know, people will say we don't, we we follow the new Testament, not the old Testament, except they do follow some stuff from the old Testament. Um, They they really like the 10 commandments or at least some of them. Mm Mm-hmm. It, but it's interesting how, and you bring out really good points just about like the things that we're supposed to take literally and metaphorically. Yeah. And, and, but I also feel like when, even when people wrap their heads around that understanding, there's still different, there's, there's still other things to figure out. Um, there's still things that are at least on the surface feel very problematic about the Bible. Yeah, I think for let's we did a sermon series um, about a month and a half ago that we do every couple of years called Skeptics Welcome, where we, you know, just try to sort through some doubts and questions and skepticism that people have. And the issue of biblical interpretation came up. And one of the things that we talked about is how, let's say, you know, a, a strength of what we could call conservative Bible reading Um is this understanding that, you know, scripture doesn't just claim to be an inspiring collection of fairy tales, but it claims to tell the story of the real action of the living God in the real world. And, and there's a sense, you know, in which conservatives desire to affirm that literal history at the heart of scripture story is very, very important. And it's essential to good Bible reading. Um, the weakness of conservative Bible reading would probably be the flip side of the strength, which is just, conservatives try to read all the Bible as literally as possible. Mm. And that can get you into a lot of trouble. And kind of to your point, you know, the fundamental rule of good biblical hermeneutics is that uh, we should try to read as the author intends. And so if the author is not intending to write a literal history, let's say Genesis 1 through 2, then it would be an act of, you know, interpretive unfaithfulness and undermining Scripture's authority to try to read it as such. Um, And those are some kind of, you know, like you said, it seems like that should be more basic for people. Um, But depending upon your context, and I don't mean to pick on conservatives, but that's just one example where there's this belief that to read the Bible as literally as possible is to take it more seriously than everybody else. But that's literally, you know, one of the basic rules of biblical interpretation is getting violated there. And, And I agree that we don't do a good enough job. Heck, I probably don't at my church consistently reminding people explicitly how to read the Bible. I think we hope that they'll just pick up on it, you know, by watching what we do. Um, But I know sometimes I can be too subtle and assume too much, and we need to just be a little bit clearer, in particular when it comes to how we interpret Scripture. So you spend a lot of time talking about just what we generally call the problem of evil. For me, I really feel like that is where Christian apologetics today need to focus in on. Um, I don't, like, I don't need to know, you know, did Satan bury dinosaur bones in the desert? (laughs) Doesn't do a lot for me. Uh, And, but these problems of, these problems of evil are ones that are the hardest to deal with. Yeah, I think, you know, when you look at, A, I I agree, 
uh, with you, your premise, that I, I really think that um, evil is by far the best reason to not be a, a Christian. Um, one of the stories I tell in, in the book, um, and, and everyone's probably had their own moment where this realization kind of landed on it, but I had been on a trip to Nepal where our church partners with some uh, orphanages, and I'd been back for a couple of weeks, and this enormous earthquake struck Nepal. Um, and, you know, it was the April 25th, 2015 earthquake where 9,000 people died. And it was this really surreal moment for me where I, I remember vividly, I'm on my bed at my house with my little boy. He was about seven months old at the time. And, you know, seven months old, that's before they go to the dark side. And so he was sweet, <laughs> and, you know, just on the bed, you know, we're wrestling around and he's babbling. And my brother-in-law was getting married later that day. And I was performing the ceremony. It was just a perfect day. And then I learned the news of this earthquake that has struck Nepal. And, and I thought about all these orphans that I had been with. And I really don't think this is being sentimental. It's just thinking about these orphans on the other side of the world, buried beneath the rubble. And they don't even have any parents to look for them and know that they're missing. And yet here I am with my little boy on a perfect day. Um, and it was as if this juxtaposition of those two things, the orphan suffering and my little boy's bliss, made me understand in a way I had not before just how beautiful and terrible a place the world really is. And, and I've just often wondered, like, if we really um, understood down deep in our bones how deep the world's sadness runs, you know, if, if we could feel the full weight of all the abuse, all the cancer, all the tiny infant tombstones, could we see all that stuff and still believe? You know, and luckily that's not a question any of us have to answer, honestly, because I don't know that we'd like what we would discover. Um, but that's kind of the open-ended question that is the problem of, of evil. Um, the world's pity runs so deep that I'm not sure we could believe anymore if we felt the full weight of it. And so that's why I think that, um, you know, when I'm falling in line here with people as diverse as David Bentley Hart, who I, I love and quote a lot, and also though someone like Fleming Rutledge, who's much more conservative than Hart, but there's this consensus that has emerged over the years that um, we should not try to explain evil. Um, Hart uses this phrase that, you know, we should rage against an explanation. Mm -hmm. Any explanation we could try to give is inadequate to the world's suffering. And if we try to give one, it really only reveals that we are naive as to how deep the world's sadness really runs. And so I think it's important in a certain sense to say we do not know and we cannot give a good explanation for evil um, and it would be a heresy of sorts to even try. You know, for me personally, I feel like it's, I feel like 85% of the time I acknowledge that it's a problem, but it's a distant problem. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's not really like a felt problem. And then, yeah. but that other 15% of the time, it is a terrible problem where, it may, you know, perhaps somebody close to me has died or, you know, maybe perusing the internet and just coming across some kind of horrific news and, and my mind wraps itself around it and, yeah. and thus the, the problem that it creates and just how devastating the problem of evil is and how I think faith stealing it can be. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, you know, Henry Nowen's got a great line where he, he says something to the effect of um, when we're younger, we naively think we can just take on all of reality. You know, I want the truth. I can handle the truth. Give me the truth. But as we get older, we, we become a little more realistic about how unable any of us would be to shoulder the full burden of reality. And so if, if we all... That's why I think like in, in an era where, um, you know, news is so much more accessible and we just know so much more and we're constantly barraged with new information. We have to be, I think, smart um, about learning to shield ourselves um, from just too much of reality. No single person can shoulder all of reality. And so I know one of the things I've had to try to do is my little bitty world, you know, the little world that Austin Fisher lives in, it has enough evil and suffering to make yes. me not want to get out of bed in the morning. And so it's my job to be faithfully present to my world, not to shoulder all the world's evil. That's only something that Jesus could do. And thankfully it was something that he did. I think about that all the time with 
the advent of the internet and social media and e- even before that just with with television and radio um we are uh, allowed to be made aware of every tragedy and injustice anywhere almost anywhere in the world and it really i really do feel like god did not make the human soul capable of of bearing all that grief and i think you said it so well that if i can focus on there's enough tragedy to go around in my immediate geographic area and be a part of god's work in providing restoration and healing and reconciliation in that area. I think that's what faithfulness looks like. And I don't think it's about, you know, shutting our eyes to the injustices in the world and things that are going on in other countries, and especially with people that are less privileged than us. But I also think that we will, you know, I think it's a psychological fact that if we have too many choices, we will pick none. And I think looking out today, there are too many choices of people and situations that need our help that we will become paralyzed by that and and instead of helping do nothing. Yeah, I think Richard Beck is the one who coined this concept, or maybe he borrowed it, but he he talks about um, the problem of progressive burnout. And and what he's referring to is... um, sometimes the progressive tendency to be so constantly uh, aware or, or raging over the world's injustice, which again, like in some sense, of course we have to do, but it can become such a um, constant terminal thing that it just, it just literally burns you out and extinguishes your faith. You're just raging and angry and grieving all the time. And we shouldn't turn a blind eye to the world's injustices. Of course we shouldn't. And we shouldn't, you know, take some privileged, uh, you know, retreatful position. But we also have to be mindful of the frame God has given us. And I don't think God designed us to have a quote unquote, you know, global community. I think the whole idea of a global community is absurd. Like I can only occupy literally one square foot of dirt at a time. And if I can be faithful to that one square foot of dirt, and of course, you know, a a bit bigger proximity than that, but the city that I'm in, the community that I'm in and be faithful to it and all in on it, I think that's what God has asked me to do, not burn myself out and vicariously suffering and grieving for every injustice, because I can't do anything about that. It's just raging into a whirlwind that accomplishes nothing. So let's talk a little bit about how Christians historically have dealt with this. There has been a line of thought that God ordains evil because it allows his glory to shine all the brighter and we can see his goodness because of evil. Um, You outline that position in the book really well to the point that I thought, wait, does Austin believe this? And if I hadn't (laughs) If I hadn't read your previous book, I might think you did. Um, And then, uh, but then you outline an alternative as well. I'm very glad to hear you say that um, because my goal (laughs) was to, um, I I am, you know, not a a Calvinist, um, obviously, um, but I I grant, and and so I'm a, a lead pastor at a church. My other lead pastor, there are two of us, he actually is a Calvinist. And so this is not theoretical for me. It's something I have to actually live day in and day out. Um, And that I I do think, though I reject, let's say, Calvinism and some of the beliefs associated with it, it is a biblical option, meaning um, you can absolutely kind of put together the various teachings and things said in Scripture and come up with something like Calvinism. And it does have a place within the kind of historic orthodoxy of the church. I don't know how any, you know, um, truthful person could deny that that's so. However, um, I do think there's a better way to make sense of the various teachings of Scripture on this particular topic of evil and God's involvement in evil. And so what I trace out in the book is really what I would just call classical theism, um, which is this belief that um, you know God wanted a world with the possibility of love. Love requires the possibility of freedom. Freedom requires the possibility of evil. 
um, and evil, obviously, and unfortunately occurred, but it's not something that God wanted or desired. Um, and so when it comes into that question of, you know, well, okay, you know, yes, you know, the fallen world and evil is a result of human and angelic beings um, using their freedom wrongly, but, you know, how did that happen? Um, I think scripture really stops trying to give explanations there. Um, Greg Boyd kind of uses this phrase or something like it. He says, freedom is an ultimate explanation. You've kind of hit bedrock. And so we can't really get past that. What we can say is God wanted a world where he had free, loving creatures. That meant evil had to be a possibility. And it was a possibility that was realized to God's great grief. And it's something that God has died to uh, ultimately put to death. Well, you said something really great that I'd never thought of uh, in, in the book. You, you mentioned why the Bible doesn't specifically address the problem of evil. Now, we've got Job, which is really, uh, you know, really fantastic treatment of it, but in the, they don't really talk about it the same way as we do. They, they don't outline, you know, there's a good God, he's all powerful, he's all good, uh, thus why do bad things happen? Yeah. And part of, you say part of the reason for that is because they are firm believers in the spiritual realm where warfare is going on. Yeah, a number of different writers have um, really hit in on this on the, in the last few years. David Bentley Hart, who I mentioned earlier, and Fleming Rutledge. Uh, and again, they're on kind of different sides of the theological spectrum. Um, N.T. Wright has done a good job too, but but rehabilitating this idea of the deeply apocalyptic worldview of the writers of Scripture, especially the New Testament. You know, and it's I know it's it's, it's strange for us because we're modern people, but the biblical writers work um, within this worldview wherein the cosmos, the earth, is a battleground where God is at war with the powers and principalities and these, you know, evil spirits and angels. And so they never stop to ask the question, why do bad things happen, you know, to good people or why do bad things happen to people? Because they knew why, right? Because the world's a battlefield. God and Satan are locked in this deep conflict. And so evil is just to be expected. But because we just have kind of um, had our world demythologized and we think a lot of that spiritual stuff sounds hokey and it's antiquated and primal and ignorant, um, we ask these really logical questions, you know, about, well, you know, if there's a God who's all powerful and all good, where thus does evil come from? You know, kind of quote David Hume there. But the biblical writers didn't ask those questions because they didn't think about the world the way they, that we did. And we've got to recover, I think, some of that apocalyptic worldview to understand the biblical world. Something else that that often, and I'm surprised how often, turns causes people to lose their faith or to never actually consider Christianity is the concept of hell. And specifically, most people, if you ask them what is the Christian concept of hell, they would probably not use the words, but they would describe some version of eternal conscious torment. Um. I'm curious about your journey from with your theology of hell. Has, has that changed over time? And, and where are you with that now? So I grew up, um, my, my dad was Church of Christ. My mom was Methodist. They met, I guess, in the middle on a Baptist church. <laughs> and so I grew up Southern Baptist. And so, yeah, e eternal conscious torment was absolutely the view of how I kind of grew up with um, that began to flex and morph over time as I just had certain questions that I think a lot of people have had about how is that, you know, how could a good and kind God uh, just, yes, but, but, but loving torture people forever for sins that they committed um, that they are, yes, obviously responsible for, but they were, you know, uh, dealt this pretty crap hand where they're born into a fallen world where it doesn't really look like they have any options. So, so, and so it just feels a little unjust in a certain sense and incommiserate. And so you know, I went through a, a process like a lot of people did of just trying to figure out what scripture said and how to stay faithful to what scripture said and what the church had historically said. Um, and, and ended up coming to this place where, um, you know, I, I can't go uh, full blown universalism. Um, and I kind of sketched that out in the book. There are a couple of great quotes. Um, one of them's by this monk named Christian something, Gottlieb Bart, I think was his name. And he said, um, whoever does not hope for the universal reconciliation is an ox. 
but whoever teaches it is an ass. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a great quote. It. I, I don't even remember where I came across it, but I think that would really summarize where I would land. Like, I think every Christian has to hope for the reconciliation of all things. Scripture explicitly teaches the reconciliation of all things in a number of different places. Colossians 1, 15 through 20 is really the most obvious where we're told that all things, and all clearly means all in context there, have been reconciled to God through Christ. And so we've got clear, Scripture clearly teaching universal reconciliation in a certain sense. But then we've also got these very clear New Testament teachings wherein, you know, some sort of ultimate judgment might await some people or principalities or powers who resist the love of God. So how do we hold those things together? Um, and I've been on a journey trying to sort that out. What I sketch out in the book ends up being a position of what you'd probably call like a self-inflicted annihilationism. Yeah. Um, and annihilationism, I really think once you do the biblical work, it is clearly the more biblical option compared to eternal conscious torment. Now, there's some debate about that, um, but I, I found that to clearly be the case. Um, and so that's what I would end up signing up for. Like God will love all people forever. I, I don't think that's disputable, but I think it's possible some people might hate him for it. And I think it's possible that in the end, God might say, as C.S. Lewis says, thy will be done. And if you reject the love of God for eternity, I think there's a chance that you kind of snuff yourself out of existence. N.T. Wright says something pretty similar. So I've landed in a very similar spot. I had, it was last year or the year before, I had the guys on from Rethinking Hell. I don't know if you're familiar yeah. with, with them. Yeah, they're great. Um, they are, they're so great. And I was shocked. I think that was like the most downloaded episode of the year. Mm -hmm. And and no offense to them, but they're not exactly big names that people know of, <laughs> which told me that it was the subject matter that people were so interested in. And I, I'm so shocked at people who cannot get over the things that they were taught and, and they have doubts about it but, it, but it bothers them still. Eternal conscious torment bothers them still, and they and they they can't. But at the same time, they can't let go of it um, because it's been yeah, so ingrained yeah. in them. I just I think that is fascinating. When really, when you look at the at the text, at the very least, it could should cast strong doubt on eternal conscious torment. Yeah, I think it's when it comes to these issues. Um, I've always found it's helpful to just think about the way we make decisions, right? And so a helpful visual for me has always been, you know, every one of us in our brain or heart or whatever, we have this little inner Supreme Court, you know? And so let's say there are nine votes and on some issues, you know, everybody lines up real clearly and it's a 9-0 decision on something. Um, but then on a lot of decisions that we have to make and opinions we have to form, it's, it's not that simple. And so it could be, you know, a 7-2 split or a 5-4 <clears throat> or a 4-4 with one undecided. And I think that's a much more helpful way to talk about our beliefs. It's a more honest way, certainly, to talk about our beliefs. And so when it comes to something like hell and eternal conscious torment, I think it's important to say, you know, like, of course, <clears throat> you can make a case for eternal conscious torment, just like you can make a case for Calvinism. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, my little Supreme Court says it's, you know, a 7-2 decision in favor of something that probably looks more like annihilationism. And I really do think that's a more biblical way to look at it. And for me, not only do I feel like the scripture more closely aligns with annihilationism, but it also just the the meta narrative of scripture and who God is and the character of God, it seems to be more in line with who who the Bible testifies that God is. Yeah, when you, you know, there are these moments, like you said, where let's say um, you, you, you're you on, you know, somehow some terrible story from the news comes across your feed. And I think your phrase was you, you're able to wrap your brain around it and you really just feel it down in your bones in yeah. a way that you hadn't before. I think when people really wrap their brains around what eternal conscious torment means um i mean it's just it's a horrendous thing i mean i i mean it's it's impossible to wrap our brains around that and so it's tough to understand certainly how um a good god and maybe just a just god i mean honestly it's tough to see how it's just for humans to be eternally consciously tortured 
for sins they made in this life in a fallen world. It just doesn't seem, you know, again, obviously it doesn't seem loving, but I don't know that you can even make a case that it's just. Now, of course, the argument would be, well, God's infinitely holy, so any transgression against God is worth infinite punishment. And I just don't know that that's a sequitur argument. Yeah, those seems to be kind of rhetorical devices to <laughs> skirt the issue at hand, I feel like. And yeah, to your point, it's... It has bothered me for a long time the thought of even a even a, a pretty evil person dying and going to hell. If they're pretty evil for, you know, 80 years of their life, well okay, what would like a just punishment look like? Yeah. 800 years, 8000 years, but an eternity is so much longer than either of those. Yeah, I mean, could you even imagine us with a criminal who'd done something horrific, you know, for <clears throat> Yeah, let's call it 20 years. Can you imagine a scenario where any just not completely cretinous human would say, oh, okay, let's torture them for 20 years? Right? Yeah. Like, no way. Yeah. I mean, there's no way we would do that. And I have to assume that God uh, is at least more kind and just than we would be. And so eternal conscious torment philosophically and morally uh, poses some pretty, in my opinion, insurmountable problems. So... You really went through, and, and I can't remember what chapter it was in. Uh, it was so good, though. It may have been like chapter nine. You're just very transparent with doubts that you had. And and this wasn't from some distant time ago. It was when you're still a pastor. And really asking God to show himself to you, prove himself to you, and and didn't always get the answers that you wanted and I just wonder what you would say to somebody who's in this situation now. Yeah, that's probably a mix of, there's a chapter on, on silence in the book and, and the premise there is just, you know, I, I think a lot of us, we're not looking for, you know, answers to all of our questions and we're not looking to get out of life alive. <laughs> you know, we know that's not going to happen, but we're just looking for something, you know, some sign of God's presence, some whisper. We don't need a burning bush, but just a, a little whisper or assurance is all we're asking for. And so what do you do when all you're asking for is a whisper and all you get is silence? And I really do think that is um, an experience that many of us have. I did um, a kind of debate, um, I guess about three or four weeks ago with a guy on this British show who had been a Christian, but had become an atheist. And he said it so well and so poignantly. He just said, I got to the point where it just felt like the world basically, you know, rolled and carried along just like it would if there was no God. And I think that's such an honest way to explain what doubt and a crisis of faith can feel like sometimes. It's not necessarily some massive intellectual problem or some emotional this or that. It's just kind of this like, I don't feel like the world looks any different than it would if there wasn't a God. So, like, at what point does this whole thing become pretty absurd? Mm. Um, and so I, I I got to that point. I mean, I, I outlined in the book, I mean, I had a moment where I, I remember literally saying out loud, I, I don't believe in God anymore. And I don't think I meant it, you know, like as, as, a, as a Western person who's been so conditioned by the idea of God and, of course, explicitly Christianity. I don't think that I even have the capacity to know what it would mean to say I don't believe in God. Um, but on some level, I walked up to the ledge, you know, and, and kind of jumped. And um, so for someone who's in a similar place, um, a, a couple of things I would mention. One of them is, and this is hard when you've been doing it for a while, but you got to have the courage to keep the conversation going. Um, there's a chapter in the book on the book of Job, which you mentioned earlier. And I think one of the lessons we learned from Job is, you know, Job, he loses everything and most people stop reading Job, you know, after he praises God and seems to get over it. But of course, the next 36 chapters are Job just letting God have it, you know, verbally assaulting God. And at the end of this verbal assault that God, uh, that Job lays on God, God corrects Job absolutely and puts him in his place. But then God says that Job spoke rightly of him. This is Job 42, verse 6. Whereas Job's friends who had told Job to just praise God, don't doubt and get over it, have spoken wrongly and God's wrath is kindled against them. So what does it mean to say Job spoke rightly, you know, when he said these terrible things about God? And it seems like the best explanation is that 
Job spoke rightly in the sense that he had the courage to speak honestly to God, even when he didn't have anything nice to say. And so I, I think we have to develop a vocabulary um, for God that extends beyond praise, right? If we don't know how to talk to God in the midst of our skepticism and grief and lament, if praise is the only language we know, then we're going to spend a lot of our lives not knowing what to say to God. And the second thing, just briefly, would be to stay connected to the Christian community as you're processing your doubts. One of the things I see as a pastor that grieves me is people think they have to leave the church to process their doubts because, again, they've been taught that they're not allowed to have doubts. And so in the moments where they most need the church, where they most need to let the faith of others kind of carry them, they actually isolate themselves from the community. And so in what was a really dark season for me, one of the good things about being a pastor is I didn't have the luxury of not showing up to church. And so (laughs) the faith of other people actually was able to kind of carry my faith for a season. And even though I wasn't sure if I believed or at least believed some things, I saw, you know, other people believing and it, it carried my faith and it eventually resuscitated my faith. And so I think those are two helpful things. Well, I think that's why it's so important for churches to be places where they're the first place we go when we yeah. are in the midst of doubt and a crisis of faith. And, and so that we know that we're not going to be met with judgment. But when we can go and if we can be honest and say, I, you know, I think I'm losing my faith or I'm just in a season of doubt or whatever that looks like for a person, for them to be met with, okay, we're here with you in that and we want to walk with you through that instead of some sort of rebuke. Well, if you, maybe if you just prayed a little bit more or if you just loved God more, but be a place where people can know that they can come and be transparent and honest about the doubts they're going through. Yeah, there's this great, you know, simple verse in the book of Jude, which is a real book, um, Jude 22, (laughs) which just says, be merciful to those who doubt, right? And I have to assume that, you know, God tells us to be merciful to those who doubt because God is merciful to those who doubt. And yet, instead of being merciful, we're typically very impatient and judgmental and certainly not understanding with people who doubt. And I think a lot of that is because it makes us uncomfortable. <laughs> you know, like we, yeah. we, we all want to pretend like we're certain. And so when somebody, you know, comes in, it's like somebody, you know, you know admitting to the room that the emperor is not wearing any clothes. And so we're uncomfortable with that. And so we try to yeah. banish them. Yeah. Um, but I, I agree. The church has to be the most honest place in the world. And this whole desire to make the church a, a place that's hospitable to questions and skepticism, I think it's important to note that that isn't, you know, like a, a postmodern capitulation to the skeptical world. Mm. No, this is something that has been present in the Christian tradition since its very beginnings. Uh, one of the stories I tell in the book is the story of the Great Commission, Matthew 28, and we're told that the apostles go up to this mountain in Galilee they experience the resurrected Christ, okay? Not just pre res This is resurrected Jesus. We're told that they, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but they still doubted. Mm. Right? This is a remarkable story. Think about that for a second. How could somebody, the apostles, look into the eyes of the resurrected Christ, stand in his presence, and still doubt? Now, I don't know how to answer that question, honestly. I don't know how that's possible, but what I, I do know is that Jesus used this group of of worshiping doubters to build the church. And so no Christian should ever think they have to choose between Jesus and their doubt because the church is literally built on people who lived out that contradiction. I don't know about you, Austin, but I, I know for me, kind of changing my relationship with doubt was really transformative in a big way. I mean, it just had far reaching impacts on my faith in ways that I didn't expect it to, you know, a few years ago when Greg Boyd wrote the benefit of the doubt, that was, that was huge for me. And one of the things it did for me was one, I could obviously be honest about my doubts But also, it kind of gave me this freedom to just wake up every day and say, um, okay, I've got a little faith inside of me, and I've also got a little bit of doubt inside of me. But the thing that changed was, 
I, because I could ad- admit that, that there was also doubt inside of me, I could also make the choice every day to lean into the faith side. Mm-hmm. And, and it's not that I was ignoring the doubt or stuffing it away. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It was the act of exposing it that said, okay, but today I'm going to lean into the faith side. And if I'm going to lean into the faith side, I'm going to lean into the natural uh, consequences of that faith side. So in other words, um, I'm going to walk as if it is absolutely true, even if I don't fully believe that it's true. And so, whereas before, when I wouldn't acknowledge the doubt, it wasn't that it wasn't there, I just didn't acknowledge it. So it kind of had this effect of like poisoning the water, so to speak. And so when it came to things like prayer, spiritual disciplines, um, I don't think I actually knew why, but I did not do those very well. I didn't practice those very well because I wasn't really sure if those things mattered. Um, but there's something about making the decision every day that I'm going to lean into faith. And then, so if I'm leaning into faith, then the natural uh, con- consequence of these things being true means that it does matter if I pray. It does matter if I spend time in spiritual disciplines and if I love my neighbor and yeah, no Dallas, Dallas Willard. I I think it was Dallas Willard who said to believe something is to act like it's true. And that's such a simple explanation and definition, but it hits you like a ton of bricks and you just go, Oh, and Boyd touches on this idea a lot in benefit of the doubt. I thought it was the best part of the book was that faith is often thought of as like psychological certainty. Right. So yeah. faith is me being certain psychologically that I believe a certain thing or at least trying to convince myself <laughs> that I'm certain, which is a bizarre psychological gimmick. But biblically, that's not really the way we see faith portrayed. Rather than psychological certainty, faith is an act of uncertain but courageous allegiance. Right. Faith is a willingness to act faithfully despite our uncertainty. And so I think that just syncs up so well with what you're kind of describing there as you were sorting through your doubts is, is getting out of your own head and getting out of trying to convince yourself that you're certain. I mean, hey, how absurd is that, right? To try yeah, to yeah. convince yourself that you're certain of something. That's crazy. It's stupid. None of us can do it. It's not a virtue. Like if that's a virtue, then blessed are the Bigfoot hunters, you know, for they are the kingdom <laughs> of God. But it's not, right? What are, what are the virtues of Christian faith? Faith, hope, and love. Right. So what Jesus wants us to do absolutely is to be faithful, to love, you know, the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love the person in front of us as we would love ourselves. That is the goal of faith, not some sort of psychological certainty. So I completely agree. Once you get out of your own head and stop thinking of faith as this interior psychological, you know, act of certainty or cognition, but it's instead me doing the stuff Jesus has asked me to do. Even when I'm not certain, it just frees you up to get out of your own head and go do the stuff Jesus has actually asked you to do. Austin, um, man, thanks so much for being on the show. And I really want to encourage people to go get this book. I think it's going to be huge for some people in a, in a game changer. I've, I've often thought to myself, I'm not going to let anyone I know uh, lose their faith until they read The Benefit of the Doubt first. And then I think I'm going to add this book to the list. There's just so many people out there. And I think just to be a Christian today is to know many people who have left their faith. And so often for reasons that were completely avoidable. And so I hope people get this book. It's so good. Austin, thanks for being back on the show. Very kind words, Shane. And I appreciate you having me on and We'll make sure it's not uh, four years between visits next time. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Seminary Dropout. Remember, you can find all the show notes for this show and all shows at shaneblackshear.com. Oh, and hey, have you ever thought about starting your very own podcast? I bet you have, and I think you should do it. In fact, I've created a course just for you to teach you everything that I've learned over the last couple of years producing Seminary Dropout. So if you're interested in podcasting and want to learn how, 
go check out my course. You can go there by typing in podcastingforeveryone.org. And you can get a special discount by typing in the discount code Seminary Dropout, all one word. That'll give you 25% off. So go check it out. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay. Thanks to those that left ratings and reviews on iTunes this week. Remember, that keeps the show front and center. Also, remember, you can find me on Twitter at, at Beard on a Bike. That's at Beard on a Bike. Also, I'm on Facebook, facebook.com slash Shane Blackshear123. And remember that Seminary Dropout is listener supported. You can visit supportseminarydropout.com and press become a patron. Remember this music you're listening to right now is by D.L. Rossi. You can find him online on iTunes and at dlrossi.com. All right. Thanks again for joining me for another episode of Seminary Dropout. Stay tuned for next week's episode. Love you. Take care. Yeah,